Hi, and welcome to Green Deal, Big Deal, the podcast where we discuss Europe's green future. My name is Eva Ivashuk. And I'm Aaron Best. And we're pleased to join you today from the offices of Ecologic Institute in Berlin for the very first episode of our podcast series. So what is this podcast series about, Eva? Green Deal, Big Deal is a new show where we will talk about the European Green Deal, which is this huge plan that the European Union has proposed to step up the protection of environment and climate, and at the same time promote economic growth and human well-being. So all in all, it's a pretty ambitious plan. Now, as many of our listeners probably know, the main goal of the European Green Deal is to make Europe the first climate-neutral continent. But there's more to it. The plan contains actions to reduce air pollution, protect nature and biodiversity, make sure the way we produce our food is more sustainable, create green jobs, and rethink the way we live, work, and play. In this show, we'll discuss different aspects of the European Green Deal with our guests from all over Europe. So we'll be talking to the policymakers behind the plan, the entrepreneurs driving the green business ideas that bring European Green Deal to life, as well as the experts that can help us unpack and explain how it's all supposed to work. Our podcast will focus on aspects of the European Green Deal beyond just the climate targets. We'll talk about many topics, including fashion, urban parks, public transport, a whole range of issues affecting all our lives. So Eva, why are these topics important to you? So Aaron, uh, just as you, I work as a researcher at Climate and Environment Policy Think Tank Ecologic Institute. And I focus on topics of climate and biodiversity, and more specifically, how we can use nature to address the climate crisis. And I'm really looking forward to discussing with our guests how European Green Deal plans to bring these topics together. So how we can protect nature and protect climate and explore synergies between those two efforts. Moreover, I am Polish, I work in Germany, and I am very aware how diverse European Union is. And that is why I'm really interested in discussing how this plan is being received and approached in different corners of Europe. How about you, Aaron? Well, I'm an environmental economist by training, so I do a lot of thinking and writing about how we can balance uh, meeting human needs with protecting the environment and conserving resources. And that kind of environmental economic thinking is really at the heart of the European Green Deal. So it's very interesting from that perspective to be seeing uh, a policy of this scale that has those kinds of ideas at the center and uh, a role as a new framework uh, for guiding Europe uh, into uh, the future. The other reason I'm excited about what we're doing here with the podcast is that we're going to be speaking to a number of really interesting people. We'll have experts on a wide variety of topics from a variety of locations in Europe, and I'm excited to learn more about what they know about. And we're excited to take you, our listeners, with us on that journey. We invite you to follow the Green Deal, Big Deal podcast on Spotify, Apple, or wherever else you get your podcasts. We will be dropping a new episode each month, so please stay tuned. And now for our first episode. In today's podcast, we'd like to provide you with a quick overview of the European Green Deal before we dive into the details of specific issues in later episodes. To help us get this overview, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Hans Brunix, Director of the European Environment Agency. He's a political scientist and an expert and scholar in the field of European and international environmental policy. Hello, Mr. Brunix, Hans, and welcome to the first episode of the Green Deal, Big Deal, the podcast where we discuss Europe's green future. You are the Director of the European Environment Agency, could you describe the role of the agency for our listeners? Yes, thanks and uh, happy to be here and thanks for the invitation. The European Environment Agency as an independent agency in the EU system has been responsible since 1994 for in essence three things. First of all, we work with all the member states to uh, gather all the monitored data on the environment, on climate issues, on waste, on water quality, air quality. And we make sure that uh, that data is of good quality, that we can make indicators out of that, that can then be used to see whether countries are living up to the obligations under 
European environment and climate policy. The other task is uh, making what we call integrated assessments, or in simpler terms, connecting the dots. For example, what is uh, the impact of changing mobility patterns on air quality and then on human health? And then the third element which we do is we are a boundary organization, as it is called, that connects science to policy. So we also have a strong foot uh, in the scientific world through our scientific committee and a, a number of connections through scientific institutions. So three big tasks, which we have been doing since uh, 1994. This is the uh, first podcast episode in our series on the European Green Deal. Can you explain for the audience in simple terms what the European Green Deal is and what some of its most important components are? Yeah, sure. Well, I think the European Green Deal recognizes that we are living in times that we need to come with really fundamental responses to a number of challenges in the domains of environment and climate change in and of itself as a key challenge. The loss of biodiversity, which we've seen over the last decades, uh, the link with health uh, and pollution, chemicals, the, our resource use on a planetary scale, but also in Europe, that is not really sustainable because we overuse resources and we're causing environmental and health uh, issues because of that. So it's a fundamental response to that. And that means that there are a number of uh, key objectives there. And one is, of course, to become the first climate neutral continent, which should lead by 2050, mid-century, to what is called net zero emissions, that we emit very little greenhouse gases. And the ones that we still emit, we compensate through either technology or through the natural carbon system. That's, that's one big part of the European Green Deal. Then the other one is a biodiversity strategy, which uh, really focuses on restoring ecosystems, on making them more resilient, and also in placing them much more in a societal context linked to health, uh, linked to better living conditions, and that sort of connected objectives. The third one is a circular economy, uh, where we keep materials much longer in the economic cycle, we keep reusing them rather than the linear model of we dig up resources, we make stuff, and then when it's at the end of its lifetime, we throw it away. So closing that material cycle is a third big objective. And then there is a really strongly stated policy objective, which is called zero pollution. That means that we will further reduce and speed up the reduction of pollutants. And then there is a farm to fork strategy, which for the first time looks not at agriculture as a sort of isolated part of the food system, but really at the food system and how that is linked to environment and climate objectives to that is linked to human health and how that is an essential part of a, a sustainable future. And then you could say there are a couple of enabling lines in that Green Deal. An essential one is, of course, well known by now. It is the sustainable finance initiatives, which are pushing and driving investments towards the priorities of sustainability, the ones that I've just mentioned before. And then the last element is that uh, Europe has the ambition to lead also as an industrial continent in these fundamental transitions. So it wants to come with an industrial policy that will produce the goods, the machines, the instruments, the tools that we will need for this type of transition. So if you take all of that together, it is much more than a set of environment and climate objectives. The Green Deal, you can be considered as the most integrated program of economic and systemic change that Europe has ever put on the table. So you, you've been involved in European environmental policy for some time, and I'd be interested in a sort of a contrasting of how you'd characterize environmental policy before and now. If you were to really you know, paint a picture for the listeners about what makes this different than the way things used to be approached. Well, first of all, I think this is really a set of objectives and policy frames that is much more systemic 
in order to really deliver on this agenda, we will need to go to interconnected systemic changes in economy and society. And that's what we call transitions. Yeah? And the European Green Deal is clear. It clearly states that Europe should lead this transition, that it is our biggest responsibility and that it is a response to existential threats. Well, so that means a sense of urgency, a specific type of response, systemic, and the ambition to really be in the lead. And this is Europe's contribution and response also to uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, which in essence boil down to uh, creating the conditions to provide a decent living quality of life uh, for people within planetary boundaries. So the recognition of that context as the central sort of framing is incredibly important because environmental policies for a long time have been on the margins of the debate. Yeah, they are now put at the center of societal debate. That's why Europe also calls it its investment strategy, uh, its economic strategy, its social strategy. Those elements are really critical. The second uh, thing which sets it apart for me is that most of these uh, ambitions really cross-reference. And I think it's fair to say that over the decade, we've often dealt with environment issues in a rather fragmented way. Water, air, waste, land, and soil in that sort of approach. By now, this type of systemic integration and connection is absolutely central. Yeah. And then a the last element, which I think is really challenging, but absolutely necessary and different, is the connection with the social dimension. Yeah. The Green Deal also talks about a just transition. Well, it's the first time that Europe is so explicit about the necessity to really link whatever it is we do on environment and climate to uh, the living conditions of people, to elements of inequality, to distribution. For example, in an energy transition, what will happen to regions that are now uh, really dependent on an old industry that is carbon-based, uh, coal mining regions, for example? But also, what will we be doing with uh, all the people who are manufacturing the automobiles of the past, and will they be the ones that will be working on the automobiles of the future in a sustainable transport and mobility system? So those essential social dimensions are also part of it. And if you take all of that together, it is really a set of policies of a different dimension. And if I can compare it, and I know this is a bit short through the curve and simplifying things, but you could say that the first generation of environmental policies was focusing on reducing pollution. Yeah? And that was needed because we, we had really bad air and water pollution, for example. So the second generation was more about efficiency. Let's not question the current systems or technologies too much, but we need to make them more efficient. And we've seen great strides uh, in that. But still, that was not leading to fundamental sustainability. And so this type of policies is challenging sectors in society not to become less polluting and more efficient, but to reinvent themselves within a fundamental paradigm of sustainability. And that means providing well-being within planetary boundaries. I would be very curious to know if, you know, in light of what we know, what science tells us, what is the level of action we have to take globally in order to indeed avoid catastrophic climate change, avoid catastrophic uh, loss of nature? If you think that the European Green Deal is ambitious enough, do you perceive that there is a room to ramp up this ambition in the coming years? And do you think it is an adequate response by the European Union? Okay, those are a lot of questions. So I'll try to uh, respond to them uh, starting from the, the global level. Yeah, um, I think if you look at the global scientific panels that have framed these challenges, and that's the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in that domain, 
IPBES, uh, the Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, the IRP, the International Resource Panel, which is less known but actually talks a lot about our systems of production and consumption and how they impact climate and biodiversity loss, but also the World Health Organization, the link with environment, climate, and our human health and well-being. If you take those panels together, they are really clear. We are living in a pivotal decade where we will really have to respond fundamentally to these challenges. They also point out that we are already dealing with irreversible change. Now, the climate is changing. We have lost quite a number of species. We have seen uh, deforestation at a scale that will be very difficult to reverse in the short time. So responding to that is really critical. And we need to speed up and scale up fundamental solutions. Now, I think those notions are embedded in the Green Deal. And the targets for 2030 are very ambitious in most domains. They are a clear break with the speed of change that we've seen in the past. There is a clear link with uh, rather fundamental sectoral policy ambitions in mobility, in energy, in the food system. And they are science informed. Uh, so uh, I think overall you can say that this is Europe's most ambitions, science-based, informed by, by solid knowledge, response to those challenges. Should we increase the ambitions? I think you can have a lot of discussions on that. Depending to whom you speak, they will say, of course, or of course not, eh, because it's too fast for my sector or my, my economic functioning or whatever. I think what is probably more important in the next years is that we guarantee that we can translate these ambitions into actual policies that we are implementing at national level, at urban level, in economic sectors, that this shift and ambition to shift investments uh, towards sustainability is really taking off. And we step away from environmentally harmful subsidies and tax systems. So really seeing that shift in actual practices you mentioned the importance of transforming the targets into the implementation, into specific policies. And I wanted to ask you, after more than two years now that the European Green Deal was first announced, could you tell us what has been achieved so far? Well, I think that it's clear that the almost tsunami of legislative proposals of strategies is just enormous. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the European institutions with the European Commission in the lead of taking the initiatives, and that's also its institutional role, of course, has been formulating an enormous amount of policy that is going through uh, the co-decision uh, institutions, the parliament and the council, and it is then translated in all sorts of elements, national policies, urban policies, but also monitoring, reporting uh, initiatives uh, that then land in the European Environment Agency. Often it has been driving uh, a research and innovation agenda. So the activity under the Green Deal that we have seen in the last two years in these domains is unparalleled. Yeah. And it, that is recognized by everybody, even those who are rather critical of the ambitions that they think should be higher or those who think that the instruments are not strong enough, or those who think that we should speed up elements. Everybody recognizes the enormous amount of activity and legislative work that has been done, and that is still in the pipeline. That's quite remarkable. In our audience of the podcast, we have uh, quite many young people. And I wanted to ask you, in your view, how is this transformative development that the European Green Deal is? likely to affect their lives? So let's say, you know, a young person, a student comes to you with that question. What would you tell them? First of all, the Green Deal is about their future. It is in essence about their future. If we don't bend the negative trends of unsustainability on climate, on biodiversity loss, on the impact of the environment on human health, unsustainable resource use, on all of these things, 
it will make the future very difficult and costly and with serious impacts that are very undesirable. I also think they will be alive, uh, most likely in 2050, uh, when, when I will probably be long gone. But they will see the impacts of that. And it should deliver better cities uh, that are nicer to live in, with cleaner air, with more green and blue spaces, with more healthy mobility modes. They will see a shift in dietary patterns that will be better for the planet, but also for human health. And probably they will be part of a generation where it is obvious that our relationship as humankind to the surroundings, eh, the environment that surrounds us is uh, really being transformed. When I was young, you still had to sort of fight for that. When I was in university, in the social and political sciences and in economics, this was considered to be a side issue, if at all mentioned. If you're uh, young now and you're an engineering student, you will be engineering the technologies of the future. If you're an economics or a business uh, major, you will be working on the business models that will facilitate sustainability as an economic model. If you're working on inequality and poverty issues, you will be exposed to linkages with environment and climate, which were absolutely not the case when I was a student. Those were two completely separate worlds. Yeah, thank you for sketching out those future perspectives. Um, I'd like to conclude our interview on, on more of a personal note. I, I always find it interesting to speak with people about what calls them to their work, especially when their work is, is related to a, you know, a passion project, something they care deeply about. Um, what aspects of the European Green Deal are especially important to you personally? And what is a particular change that you're very excited about witnessing uh, in the coming years? Well, I've been passionate about uh, bringing knowledge to policy settings for 30 years uh, uh, or more. And we are now witnessing a policy context that has never been more ambitious in the domains that I'm interested in, that is calling for a different type of knowledge, uh, forward-looking knowledge, actionable knowledge that can speed up and scale up the, the necessary change, knowledge about our economic model and how it relates to that natural environment and that sort of fundamental type questions and how we can translate that in knowledge that can be understood and be driving policy makers and actors in society, I find really fascinating. And I'm extremely motivated to contribute to that sort of connection between essential knowledge shifts, driving essential policy shifts. And of course, uh, the more I can see outcomes in real life of that, uh, the, more, the more I am motivated and enthusiastic to deliver on that. But also, the more you see how climate change is posing threats to society and causing damage, the more I am motivated to explain to people why it is so essential to deliver on this agenda. And so, yeah, I, I couldn't be more motivated than I am today to contribute to this project. Great. Well, thank you, Mr. Brunix, uh, Hans, for sharing your expertise and your perspectives today, for painting a great background picture for our listeners about what the European Green Deal is and some of its essential attributes. And thank you for taking time and joining us. It was my pleasure. Thanks. So, Aaron, we just completed our first interview of the podcast. What sticks with you from this conversation? Well, it was interesting for me hearing about the long view on environmental policy, on how policy has become much more systemic rather than being about isolated uh, environmental issues. So for you know anyone wanting to understand why the European Green Deal is so complex in terms of the number of areas it's touching on, that historical perspective is actually quite helpful. Yes, and at the same time, I found it quite interesting to understand uh, how much has already been done in the first two years. So it's a long-term plan, but it promoted a lot of action in the short term. And now we'll turn from Copenhagen, where the European Environment Agency is based, to Sweden, 
home of the Stockholm Environment Institute, an environmental policy think tank. Our next guest is Dr. Ose Persson, the research director of the Institute. Dr. Persson is an expert in sustainable development and global governance of environmental issues. She's the perfect person to speak with us about the impact the European Green Deal is already having, also beyond Europe's borders, and how the plan can help Europe deal with major crises going forward. Dr. Persson, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Let's uh, start with a planetary perspective. You are among the authors of the concept of planetary boundaries. Could you explain for a broad audience what planetary boundaries are? What does the framework tell us about the state of the planet? Yeah, I think it's quite intuitive to many people that the planet and our environment has limits. Uh, I mean, we can see this with climate change. We're now starting to see and feel impacts. We have been emitting uh, greenhouse gases for a long time. But now we're starting to see the changes. But I think people also see this in their local environments. Uh, for example, if you spend time on the Baltic Sea, you will know that there are dead zones because of excessive pollution of nitrogen and phosphorus uh, from our agriculture. And also at the very local level, if you, you know, change ecosystems too much, for example, convert meadows to lawns, there will be less bees and less um, pollination. So this is just a kind of on a bigger scale, a planetary scale. And the idea was to try to define limits or boundaries in some way. Started with um, Johan Rockström, who was my boss at the time, and director of the Stockholm Environment Institute. He really wanted to sort of define boundaries around safe space. I mean, there were many numbers flying around at the time. Uh, climate change was taking off. But uh, the motivation was really to not just focus on limits related to climate change, but also biodiversity, pollution, etc. So what we did was to first try and just identify what are the planetary boundaries, which are the really important planetary processes that provide a good living environment for us humans. And we did find nine of them. And then the second task we had was to try and quantify the sort of boundary value, you know, over which limit does it become dangerous. So for example, for climate change, the limit is 350 ppm carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So that was the whole idea to try and quantify limits to kind of outline the safe space for humans. What we know now, 10 years later, is that out of these nine boundaries, we have already crossed five of them. Uh, the fifth one we just recently learned about actually relates to chemical pollution, uh, which we did not manage to quantify initially, but now there's new research that has done that. So it's a pretty bad state. The UN Secretary General would say we're in a code red for humanity. So, so based on the findings regarding where we've overshot planetary boundaries, is the European Green Deal addressing the right issues? And will it be enough to make a difference? I think it is. I believe it, the Green Deal actually you know, refers explicitly to the planetary boundaries at some point. Uh, but I find the Green Deal comprehensive. It's not just about climate change. If you open a newspaper these days, you can easily believe that climate change is the only environmental issue we're facing. But the Green Deal rightly addresses circular economy, biodiversity, pollution, etc. So I think it's a very powerful frame for environmental policy. <clears throat> it sort of brings all these issues together before it was very fragmented. And I think it's also a powerful story why we should protect our environment. Whether it's enough, that's a different question. Uh, I mean, I was very impressed, actually, with the level of ambition when I saw it, so from a scientific perspective. But as, as we know, many of these environmental issues are global in their nature. So EU action will not be enough. EU really must you know, leverage its leadership to be a political leader, financial leader, a regulatory leader, and also get others on board. The Green Deal promises a lot, uh, very big promises, big strategies, but it's all in the implementation really at member state level. So first, member states need to agree on how to actually implement all the, the goals and, and big ideas, you know, what are the actual policy instruments and the taxes and so on to be used. 
And secondly, it's up to the member states to really do the nitty gritty at home and implement these goals in their national legislation. You have mentioned the role of the EU leadership to address those problems in a global level, in a global manner. And I would be curious to know, in your discussions with international experts and colleagues, have you seen the European Green Deal already having impact beyond Europe's borders? Um, Well, I would say it's definitely known. And that's also because Europe, even before the Green Deal, was a bit of an environmental forerunner. But actually, I have seen green deals elsewhere. We know there was a big proposal in the US, um, a Green New Deal, South Korea. I know also some cities have launched these green deal strategies. After the financial crisis in 2008, there was a proposal to set up a kind of global green deal where rich countries would have some responsibilities, developing countries would have some other responsibilities. But it didn't really take off at the time. But yes, I do think uh, the EU green deal is known globally now. Let's talk a bit about the strengths and weaknesses of the European Green Deal as a plan of action for the EU. And uh, frequently it's uh, spoken about that the comprehensiveness uh, of the European Green Deal is one of its strengths. But I'd I'd like to turn that a bit around and ask kind of a radical question, actually. Uh, The European Green Deal, isn't it all a bit too complex and far-reaching? I think that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I think... Again, from a scientific point of view, I think it does reflect the level of ambition that we need if we're going to reduce these planetary pressures. So it should be complex. It should be far reaching. But I think they have also quite successfully from the commission presented this not just as, you know, a very big policy program. And actually, if you have looked at the documents, it's a very very ambitious time frame. They're going to propose so much legislation in a few years. But what I think they have done very successfully is to provide a story of the EU Green Deal. So it's sort of presented as a new project or identity for the EU. I think they are really trying to make it into this unifying concept for member states and for citizens of Europe, where where there is a higher purpose than the EU single market, which used to be the case. I think I was also surprised actually to see the quite broad political support Initially, uh, we know that from political science that environmental issues can be easier to get parties of quite different ideologies to cooperate around. For me, I think the, one of the big questions, you know, coming back to your question, is too complex and, and too far reaching. The real uh, litmus test will be whether the Green Deal will uh, last beyond this current commission. I believe there's going to be a new EU election in a year's time, so we will have to see what happens then. Yes, and the European Green Deal itself, it's been announced in 2019. And since then, Europe has actually been rocked by quite significant crisis. So first of all, we had the pandemic. And now we are recording this on 31st of March, the war in Ukraine, which has significant implications for energy and food security. And just to give a bit of context for our listeners, Ukraine and Russia account for 26% of the global wheat exports, 60% of sunflower oil exports, Also before the war, Ukraine was the world's fourth biggest corn producer. And we are seeing rising prices of fuels and fertilizers globally. And I would like to ask you if you could explain how the European Green Deal can help us deal with a crisis like this one. Yeah, it has been a very turbulent time now with the the Ukraine crisis prior with the, the pandemic. But I do think it seems like the Green Deal can act as a sort of compass to hold on to, to know your long-term direction when you hit turbulent waters or rocky terrain. Uh, Of course, there are other priorities now in the short term to support Ukraine, probably deal with this uh, food crisis you mentioned quite soon. But I think the Green Deal helps us to have those long-term targets and try to connect those with with the shorter term actions. But that is also hard. And we did see during the pandemic when countries around the world started to roll out these huge uh, fiscal recovery packages, basically injecting a lot of money into the market, a lot of public spending. There was this rhetoric that it should be a green recovery. They would invest in renewables, energy efficiency and so on. 
But when we actually look at the track record, it has not really been a green recovery. Hopefully it will act as a compass, but again, we have to see. Uh, we're not near the end of this, I think, at the moment. Mm -hmm. And the European Green Deal, it addresses not only the environmental issues, uh, it is also presented as Europe's economic growth strategy. It aims to transform the EU into a fair, inclusive and prosperous society. Um, and I wonder, in your perspective, how is this economic growth going to be inclusive and how can the European Green Deal promote social equity? Yeah, I think the nice objectives of the Green Deal are actually backed up by funding and by money in this case. So my understanding of the uh, social dimension of the EU Green Deal is that it will benefit regions across Europe. So they are, are using the sort of regional funding mechanisms to make green investments in parts of Europe that really need to boost their economic development, maybe reduce local unemployment. But the second uh, leg is also to um, create new jobs. So for example, there are these big plans to uh, have a renovation wave to renovate lots of Europe's housing, improve energy efficiency. So that's another element of this social dimension. Every country within the European Union will be approaching the green transition in ways that are specific to that country. And you're an expert on global environmental issues at a think tank based in Stockholm. Looking specifically at Sweden, how will Sweden be challenged to change due to the European Green Deal? Yes, I think we're starting to see challenges now because initially when, when there was a lot of focus on um, uh, you know, how to remove fossil fuels from our electricity system, for example, that didn't really mean much for Sweden because uh, here we, we are very reliant on nuclear and hydropower. But now when we are starting to see more policy on sustainable forestry from EU to sort of protect biodiversity of forests and uh, protect forest land so that it can act as a carbon sink, this does have uh, real economic implications for Sweden. Timber is a very big export product for Sweden. So, so there is a lot of uh, pushback at the moment on the forestry policies. Another area I think that is going to be challenging is energy efficiency, because we do have a lot of heavy industry in Sweden, steel production, and also paper and pulp from this timber I mentioned. And these industries use a lot of energy. So uh, that could also be challenging. But I think also that this heavy industry of Sweden is benefiting now from, from EU recovery funds. It goes, I think, both ways, some, some challenging, but also some uh, support from the EU level. And Sweden is often seen as a front runner on, in many environmental policies. Are there lessons for the European Green Deal? Um, do you see inspiration that Europe can take from Sweden in any particular ways regarding implementation of the European Green Deal? Yeah, that's a, also a good question. I think what has been a really inspiring journey here in Sweden is that the government decided to co-create roadmaps for specific industries in Sweden because the government had set the target to become fossil free, actually to become the world's first fossil free welfare state by 2045. So these industries were tasked to develop their own roadmaps and kind of hand them over to the government. So it was a little bit, you know, the reverse way. Instead of producing lots of policy regulation for these industries to just accept, they were actually asking for policy frameworks to support these roadmaps. So I think that's quite an interesting approach that the EU could also experiment with. But I would also say that whereas the Green Deal is important for Sweden in terms of these big policy instruments like emissions trading, for example, the more citizen-oriented side of the Green Deal, uh, like the Climate Pact, uh, for example, it hasn't really been so visible in the Swedish public debate. So at that sort of, in that public discourse, many member states actually relate to more their national kind of storyline of, you know, how, what will the climate transition look like? <laughs> 
Thank you for those interesting insights. Those were all the questions we had for you today. So I would like to thank you for helping us look at European Green Deal from different perspectives, looking at global EU and also a national perspective for providing a bit more nuance. We will continue to unpack the complexities of the European Green Deal throughout our podcast season. And this conversation is really a helpful frame and foundation as we set off on this journey. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. So Eva, what are the key takeaways for you from our interview with Osa? I actually found it very interesting to understand how the European Green Deal is being implemented in Sweden, because we cannot forget, you know, this is this big, complex plan that is being rolled out in the EU, but it does need to be in its implementation adapted to local realities. And it's interesting to see how Sweden has um, approached it. Yeah, I, I also found that really interesting. I always like the details of, of implementation and particular issues. Um, at the same time, I, going to the other side of the scale, um, that whole connection with planetary boundaries and how the European Green Deal is, you know, she saw it as being very ambitious, but at the same time, recognizing that you know, the, the European Union is, is limited in, in what it can do about what essentially are global problems. Uh, indeed. And turning back to our listeners, we do hope that today's conversation has uh, given you a solid overview of the European Green Deal, like it has for us, uh, and also some food for thought. We hope you'll stick around and join us in our upcoming episodes as we explore the many aspects of the European Green Deal and how they will shape the future of life in Europe. We will release a new episode each month. You can find the episodes on all major podcast platforms and apps, including Spotify, Apple, Google Podcasts, and Deezer. Please subscribe to the podcast to find the new episodes in your feed. This podcast is part of the European Environment Initiative, funded by the Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature Conservation, Nuclear Safety, and Consumer Protection. The ministry supports this initiative on the basis of a decision adopted by the German Bundestag. This podcast is produced by Karl Lehmann, Eva Ivashuk and Aaron Best. Sound design by Lena Ebley. Graphic and web design by Jennifer Rahn and Lydia Wilke. Special thanks to Camilla Bausch, Michael Lawrence, Rita Kemper, Lana Imelman, Ramiro de la Vega, Matthias Duve and Markus Kunze.